All right. So our last session, good to see so many of you still here. <laughs> um, and we're going to get uh, right into this um, as we have a lot to cover for this last session. And I don't want you guys to not enjoy some of the Sabbath evening. So we'll get right into it. Um, our scripture reading for this session is taken from Jeremiah chapter 8, um, starting at verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 8, starting at verse 15. One second, let me turn this off. Um, and the Bible and the scripture says here, We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and behold, trouble. So our message for this last session is entitled, Mental Health and the Seal of God. Mental health and the seal of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to study your truth. Lord, I'm asking that you make me a vessel, Lord. Lord, we ask that you fill all of us up now with your Holy Spirit and lead us, Lord, as we study your word into truth. And I ask, Lord, that not only would we learn something today, but we'd find some information that we can use to help others. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, one of my favorite topics to speak on is the seal of God. So we're going to go to Revelation chapter 7, starting at verse 1. The Bible says, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, um, holding uh, the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. What is the Bible describing here? Well, it says that there are four angels on the four corners of the earth, and that these angels are holding back winds of strife. I want to submit to you that God has had in place since the fall in the, in the Garden of Eden, God has withheld the full effect of sin from, the, from what it would do to this planet. In his mercy, there are angels holding back the wings of strife. Verse 2 says, and I saw another angel. This is the fifth angel in this um, story, uh, in this saga. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. And look at what it has. It has the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God where? In their foreheads. Now this, you can go back to the book of Ezekiel chapter 9. There's a, there's a, a story that I think... John, the imagery almost seems borrowed from, but there is an angel that is going to seal the foreheads with the seal of the living God. In order to get a better look at this, you go elsewhere in Revelation. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4 says this, and they shall see his face and his name shall be where? In their foreheads. So the Bible in the book of Revelation gives you two things that go in the forehead. One of them is the seal of God. And as Adventists, Traditionally, we say that this is the Sabbath is a seal. It represents a seal. But just, it's not just the keeping of the Sabbath. It's not that simple. It is what the Sabbath represents in terms of loyalty to God. That's what the seal means. It means that you are unmovable, as we shall see. But in the other verse in Revelation 22 and verse 4 says, And they shall see his face. And you know that you have to be perfect to see his face. You can't just look at this after you're glorified. But what is the sign? You have they, they, His name is written where? What does a name represent in the Bible? Character. With these things, it tells you that God is, is expecting to, for us to be sealed. And that seal will represent his character in us. It also, like I said, it can also represent the Sabbath because Sabbath represents loyalty. That loyalty is a function of our character. And so from a more neuroanatomical, neurophysiological perspective, this really represents the frontal lobe of the brain. I talk a lot about this in my talks. This is also called the prefrontal cortex. The human brain is 33% frontal lobe. The next smartest animals on the planet are porpoises and chimpanzees, and their brain is 13%. Big difference, huh? Your dog, Fido, that you think is so smart, his brain's only 7%. I won't tell you how much a cat is because we have two cats and my wife loves them a lot. So I won't tell you what percentage of cat's brain is, right? <laughs> Very different. 
The frontal lobe of the brain is where reasoning sits. Look at this. Reasoning is there. Judgment is there. This is where motor function happens, impulse control, social, sexual behavior, initiation, impulse, judgment. In other words, you are, in essence, your frontal lobe. This is why God's name is written in the forehead, because where God's name is written, it is God's character. You are basically what happens in your frontal lobe. You have a liver because your liver detoxifies the blood so that your frontal lobe can exist. You have kidneys because your kidneys purify your blood so your frontal lobe can exist. Everything about you has been built and designed so that you will have a frontal lobe. Why? It's because unlike all the other animals, only humans have the full ability to worship God because of their frontal lobe. When God made man in his image, a part of that, in, 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 at least in its execution by God, is the fact that man was created with this incredibly large, incredibly potent, and sophisticated frontal lobe. Why is it so important after the fall of man? That's in Isaiah 1 and verse 18. It says, come now and let us reason together. Where does reasoning happen? Your frontal lobe. Said the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So it is in your frontal lobe that salvation happens. Ah, oh, don't miss this thing. If you do not have a properly functioning frontal lobe, you will not choose God. The scripture says, choose you this day whom you will serve. The part of your body that makes that decision is your frontal lobe. I was, when I was talking with the teenagers a little while ago, this is why the devil wants you high on weed. This is why he wants you drunk with alcohol. This is why he wants you addicted to pornography because he can cloud your frontal lobe so that you cannot make the right decision. This is why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, why he talks about any the brain and the, transform, uh, the transforming and the renewing of the mind because it is here that these things happen. And the devil wants to destroy your frontal lobe. Because the other thing that goes along with it on a, at a mental health symposium is if your frontal lobe isn't working right, if it's not clean, you'll have all of the depressive symptoms, anxious symptoms, all of the stuff that we talked about this morning. Ellen White says it like this, Faith I Live by page 288. What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. If you are not preparing your mind to receive the seal of the living God, as outlined in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, the only other option is that you're preparing your mind for what? The mark of the beast. So again, a lot of people say, well, the mark, the mark of the beast is, will be, when certain legislation is passed regarding the worship on the first day of the week. But it's deeper than that. It is disloyalty to God. It is, a, it is either a blatant disregard for what he says or a passive one in that rather than think for yourself, you just do what everyone else does. But either way, every song we listen to, every movie we watch, every television show we watch, everything we do is either preparing our mind to receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast. So to put this in more plain terms, the you know, if you, if you lay out the human body, the Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You lay out the body, it, it, you, it lays out like the sanctuary. Hopefully you all understand a little bit about the sanctuary message. I'll, I'll say that when you do it, the, the, um, the, the, the um, golden altar, the, the bronze altar in the courtyard would be like your digestive tract. The, the um, bronze laver where you wash before you go to the holy place would be like the circulatory system. You could lay it out like your body. I cut to the chase and tell you that the part of the body that would represent the most holy part of the sanctuary would be your frontal lobe. Now, let me ask you something. Could the priest just wander into the, into the most holy place whenever he wanted to? Could he wear anything he wanted into the most holy place? In fact, he had to wear special linen. He had to wash. He had to sacrifice first. He had to deal with his own sin before he went in there. He could only go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. And if he messed that up, he could be struck down. So here's my point to you. If God uh, in, the, in the sanctuary message teaches us that to enter into the most holy place had, had that much restriction, it was that protected, how much more protected should the frontal lobe or the most holy place of your mind be protected? You see, the devil wants you to disregard this because if he can violate this space, 
This is where the Shekinah glory of God falls. That's what happens here. This is where the Holy Spirit interacts with us through neurochemicals like serotonin, like dopamine, and most importantly, like GABA. GABA is the inhibitory neurochemical that helps you behave. I honestly believe that when the Bible talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in us and the spirit of prophecy does, that there is an actual neurochemical, neuroanatomical work that happens in the brain. Because we know that when you form a habit, it creates a groove in your brain. Like a, it literally creates a pattern in your brain that you can never un- undo. The only way to overcome a bad habit is to create a deeper groove with a new habit. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so I'll give you some more details up there. But just to make the point, look at what the Bible says, Isaiah 59, 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. Notice that salvation and the helmet go together, speaking to the fact that this is where salvation happens. And helmets do what? Protect your head. So you see how that connection is? It's not just in Isaiah. It's also in Ephesians six seventeen. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the helmet of salvation. This is where salvation happens, in your head. And here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, it says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet, what? The hope of salvation. You see, when you have the hope of salvation, it protects your frontal lobe. Because there are things you won't do because you don't want to damage your hope. You don't want to mess that up. So that the, it actually functions that way. So Satan will work on your mind so that you get the wrong seal. Or really, you get the, the wrong mark. Here's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. She says, Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Never before were young men and young women confronted by perils so great as confront them today. And that's one of the things I talk with the young people about. They live in a unique time. Say, let me tell you something. In all of Earth's history, the devil has never had the tools he has to tempt young people like he has now. Didn't exist. As terrible as, the, as, as you could go back to, to all of the terrible uh, civilizations, the wickedest civilizations, It pales in comparison to what children can be exposed to today, how easily they can be exposed to these things. So character development, character building is really important. And let me say this, the the real reason, or one of the, I'll say one of the strongest reasons, you want to have good mental health because good mental health equates to good character. Or I should say it like this, you can't have good character without good mental health. Character is that ability to be honest, to be genuine, um, to, to, to do things the right way. This morning, I talked about purpose. And I showed you the studies how uh, um, young people nowadays are having a hard time finding purpose. And our purpose, the, that the, the professor from Stanford University said, purpose is one of, the lack of purpose is one of the reasons young people are in so much trouble. When I do my talk, some of the talks, I always talk about the fact that one of the reasons this happened is because they have pulled from out from under our young people and really out from under society the idea that God exists. We have been trained to believe, and many of our young, I talk to, we're talking to young people, many of them go to public school. When I went to public school all the way up until I went to Adventist College, the, the, the religion and doctrine of the public school systems in the United States far and away is evolution. Now, what evolution teaches us is that we are the 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 accidental um, consequence of uh, an a, 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 a ancient pool of sludge that existed, and somehow, nobody can really say how, that pool of sludge had the building blocks to make amino acids. Those amino acids somehow came together to make proteins. Those proteins somehow came together to make cells. And those cells somehow came together to make organisms. It takes a lot more faith to believe that than that the God of the universe created the world. But here's the problem. Then they tell you that those those cells somehow came together, made organisms, they grew fins and started swimming. And then when they grew fins, they got to the beach and said, you know what, I want to get out. And they grew feet, climbed a tree. And then when they fell out the tree, they were us. I mean, that's basically what happened. But here's what the damage that does to a young person. Remember we talked about it this morning? When you remove purpose, it actually messes with mental health. 
And if I am just the product of an ancient accident, and there really is no life for me after this, and there's no and there's no God that preceded me, what is the point? Actually, what it does is it changes things. And it creates a situation where if there's no God, and hence no purpose, then pleasure becomes the highest of all callings. And you know what? That's what I see in clinic. People are just looking to be pleased. That's what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said they would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And so everything is about pleasing yourself. But you know what? I was telling them the story of a young man who came into my office the other day. I, I, was, I was seeing patients, and he had two sexually transmitted diseases. He was a 20-something-year-old young man, and he started to cry. They say in Jamaica, a ball of living eye water. He started to cry, weeping in the office. Because one of them he can't get rid of. We have no cure for. And what was shocking was the young boy started to say, this doesn't even satisfy. He said, I'm just chasing. He said, I find, and it's funny because the girl at the front desk asked him whether or not he went to church. I didn't tell the young people this part. And by the time he got, she asked him, and by the time he got to him, he said, you know, I need to find a church. I, nobody preached to him. Nobody said anything. He was so devoid. This is why, I'm off the subject now, but this is why the loud cry is going to happen the way it will. This world is going to be in such a morally dismal place that when, the, when we begin to proclaim the three angels' messages, the third angels' message particularly, and, we, and this loud cry of the everlasting gospel go forth, there are going to be a lot of people who have not sat, have never sat where you're sitting now who are going to say, that is more fulfilling than what I've had all my life. They, and that ultimately is good for mental health. And so one article in one paper says this, pleasure is the goal of life. That's crazy. I can tell you stories. When I worked in the government, when I, the, the Bush administration, it was the George W. Bush administration, sent me to Jacksonville, Florida to speak at a teen sexual health conference. I had no idea what they signed me up for. Um, they, they heard me speak as a doctor. They, they heard my stance on, on sexuality and teens, you know, waiting until they get married and stuff. And they sent me into the Lion's Den Church. I had no idea. And, you know, me, I just preached. I, I said what I always say. Oh, my goodness, I thought I was going to be stoned. And, I mean, I just said it. I said, listen, what is it? why would you want a 13-year-old? We don't let 13-year-olds drive a car. I mean, some of them were advocating 13-year-olds should be having sex. I said, why would you want a 13-year-old? You, they can't drive a car. They can't vote. They can't drink. They can't smoke a cigarette. And they can handle procreation? I mean, are you? how does that make sense? What they, I mean, they went in on me. And I went back. Afterwards, it was really crazy. One of the ladies who was one of my was most adamantly arguing with me, came to me afterwards and pulled me aside, quietly whispered to me and said, actually, I really wish my daughter would listen to what you're saying. They fooled young people. They, what I remember them saying, that, oh, you can't, you know, 13-year-olds can't be abstinent. In what universe are you talking about? But this is what they tell, teaching them, that pleasure is the goal of life. I asked them, and I said, why would you want them to have 13 years? Oh, so they can have pleasure. What? That's a sick way to look at the world. Here's what the Bible says about it. Luke chapter 17 and verse 28 says this. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed how many of them? Them all. Look at what Jesus says in verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. They will be seeking the pleasures like Sodom and Gomorrah did. God, when Jesus is revealed, they're going to be destroyed. Pleasure is not the highest calling, and it has backfired on us. Uh, just to show you some, some data before we get back into the mental health piece of this, this is the U.S. sexually transmitted disease cases ri rise to record high. You see, you see the slope of that line? You could ski down that line. That's what you could do. You could go skiing. Why? Because we are watching, and you know what's funny? During the pandemic, you think it went down? With all that social distancing? It went up more. So you might have been social distancing, but a whole lot of people in America were not. And we are seeing, I mean, I, I say it all the time. You know, you want to treat gonorrhea nowadays? You got to, we've doubled the dose of rocephin. We can't even use penicillin anymore. 
These are serious things that are going on, and nobody talks about it because the devil wants you to think there's no consequence to sin. And the devil is a liar. They say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. My patient told me that one time. I said, not herpes. That comes back with you. 2021, U.S. drug overdose deaths hit highest level on record, the CDC data shows. So we're talking about, we talked about deaths of despair this morning. Here's some of that data. CDC data, drug overdose deaths top 100,000 in one year for the first time. Isn't that crazy? And then one of the things we were talking to young people about opiates, one of the new opiates, opiates, it's not really a new opiate, fentanyl. We used to give fentanyl patches in the hospital when I worked in the hospital on the cancer floor. That's what people are taking now for, for pleasure. And, of course, the ability to overdose is actually quite easy using some of drugs, especially when they're street drugs. And it's also led, I talked about this this morning, I wanted to show you guys some of the other slides on it, the suicide rates have almost doubled among teenagers, right? I mean, it's, we are watching something astronomical, something prophetic happen. When you look at the, all of these things, I'll show you this slide again. This is the, the slide on the deaths of despair. And you can see um, suicide is up, drug deaths have shot up, alcohol-related dr- dr- uh, deaths are up. We're, something is happening. And I want to bring this back to the seal of God. Remember that the seal of the living God goes on the forehead, in the frontal lobe. If that part of the brain is messed up, you, you can't really receive the seal of God. But the other thing that happens is, this is how the devil will get you into despair. Right? And this is the school shootings. I mean, it's just crazy things happen. Here's what Adventist homepage 403 says this. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts. The mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled, or evils without will awaken evils within, and the soul will do what? Wander in darkness. You need to guard the most holy part of your body. Your frontal lobe. She says Satan stands ready to infatuate the mind and soul to pursue a course directly contrary to God's expressed will. That he may separate that soul from God and interposes his temptations and gains control over the mind and the heart's affections. That's what the devil is looking to do. This is Satan's studied plan. This is what he does. This is what he studies. To lead souls to turn from one mighty in counsel to the persuasion of minds who have no love for God, no love for the truth. I like to read, and I just stumbled upon a book um, by uh, about Aleister Crowley. I don't know how many of you know, but it's a big, thick book. I haven't even barely begun to read the book. And already, I can literally, in the occult world, that they, uh, that, that, because this book is not a Christian book, literally, I can actually take almost passages that are exactly saying what Ellen White warns us about. I was showing my wife, I said, I'm reading, I'm like, run to her, like, you got to see this. This is unbelievable. Literally, this is what Ellen White says. And this is literally what the occult say they're doing. He is looking to turn souls from one mighty in counsel, that's God, to the persuasion of minds who have no love for God, no love for the truth. Let me give you an example. I was talking to the young people, I told them I'd give them some examples in this one. This is a, this is a, a lyric from a very popular singer. I'll show you who in a second. This is the lyric. Step on the glass, staple your tongue, bury a friend. Try to wake up, cannibal class, killing the sun, bury a friend, I want to end me. Now, let me tell you something. Somebody come around me talking like this, I'm going to keep moving. I don't watch horror movies, I don't mess with none of them spooky things. Somebody start talking like this, either, either I'm going to call Pastor Tom to lay hands on him and cast this devil out, or I'm going to run because I'm, I'm not going to stay in the middle with it. This is literally, somebody comes up to you and says this out loud. You're going to be like, okay, this, you know, this person is not right. But like I told the young people, when you put it to music, it bypasses the frontal lobe, goes deep into your conscious, and you will listen to and accept the message. Look at what she's telling you to do. Bury a friend. I'm glad I don't have friends that want to bury me. Right? Staple your tongue. Since when? And look at the last one. I want to end me. Like if This would be something if this was some no-name superstar, but it's not. This is Billie Eilish. 
incredibly popular, right? I'm not going to show you all the stuff on her, but this young lady, I'm going to show you a picture, and then I'm going to move on from her. I won't even show you the other lyrics. This is, the, this is what kids are listening to. One of my pastor friends called me almost in tears. His 14-year-old daughter, this was a few years ago, was big into this singer, and he was like, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my child. Her lyrics start, my Lucifer is lonely. That, 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 that's how it starts. You're not supposed to have a Lucifer, right? You're not supposed to own a Lucifer. Where would she get a Lucifer from, right? And I mean, I, I would read, I mean, I, normally I read through all these lyrics. It, it, it's just unbelievable. Look at this. All the good girls go to hell because even God herself has enemies. Look at that. And then she says, and once the water starts to rise and heaven's out of sight, she'll want the devil on her team. This is literally what it says in this, uh, these books where they're explaining the, the, their side of it. This is Luciferian doctrine being taught to your children. Are you guarding well the avenues of the mind? I was explaining to them in, um, in, the, in the meeting about Kanye West. Kanye West, who you, you, clearly is not on the right side of mental health right now, in my opinion, right? He has a lyric, well, Kanye West has a lyric where he said, I sold my soul to the devil, and it's a crappy deal. At least it came with a few toys, like a Happy Meal. That's literally what they teach, right? You sell your soul, and you get some stuff. DMX had a lyric like that. I could go on and on. But here's the thing. If you're listening to this, it's going to affect you. You can't listen to it and not affect you. Here's what the, the scripture says. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be you what? Be therefore sober and do what? Watch unto prayer. The Bible calls you to be sober. Let, let, let me go through a little bit of this because we're talking about the seal of God. So how does the devil get you? This is how drug addiction works. And drug addiction is a serious thing. And the way I, I used to work in addiction medicine at the, um, as part of my training out at Loma Linda, one of the things I learned was once an individual is addicted, it really isn't as much a moral decision anymore. Now it's like a disease state that has to be treated. For young people who are not, if you haven't messed with drugs, it's a moral decision still for you because you know to do it is wrong. Once someone is addicted, you've got to work with them. You've got to support them, nurture them, and bring them out of it because you can't just, it's not something you can just turn off. It's a strong, the devil knows what he's doing. This is nicotine's pathway I'm showing you here. You see him smoke the cigarette? Within six seconds, nicotine is in the brain. It gets all the way up into the, into the um, reward pathway where dopamine is. And you, instead of releasing a normal amount of dopamine, I'll show you that in a second, you release, release way more. So when you first start smoking cigarettes, I'm not talking heavy drugs, just cigarettes. What my friends told me when I was a little kid and they smoked cigarettes, they told me they get a buzz. They'd get this little high. And I never smoked. I, I told you, I was more afraid of my mother. I came home smelling like cigarettes. That would have been the end of it. Um, but they would get a buzz. Two, three years later in high school, there was no more buzz. At that point, they developed tolerance to the nicotine, and they were only smoking more and more cigarettes. And here's why they kept smoking the cigarettes. Because after a while, this is where addiction gets scary. They had to smoke cigarettes not to feel better, but to feel normal. I hope you don't miss that. The reason they have to run to take a cigarette break was because if not, they drop down. They get cranky, mean, and they have to smoke a cigarette. Nicotine makes them feel normal again. That's when, in the case, especially in the case of nicotine, addiction becomes scary. But let me show you some other things. So here, this is um, what happens with dopamine receptors. This is food. God designed us to have a pleasure pathway in the brain. Things that keep the species alive, keep you alive, you release dopamine. So when you eat food, drink water, um, obviously intimacy, sexual intimacy, these things release dopamine. But the devil figured out that he can hijack it with chemicals. So this is what food releases. This is what cocaine releases. You see the difference? And this is what, so you, you look at speed, you look at opiates, <coughs> this massive release of dopamine makes you high, but you still develop tolerance. So over time, you need more and more and more and more of the drug a lot of times in order to get where you're trying to go. All right. Marijuana is different, though. All the other drugs work on the presynaptic side, releasing dopamine. This is not really the exact same thing because these are the cannabinoid receptors. But with the dopamine receptors, marijuana works on the, what we call the postsynaptic side, on the back side, changing the receptors, making them more sensitive. It's funny, Apple News put out a thing, or one of my news things on my phone said, put out a thing saying, here are all these scientific lies you learn in biology class that aren't true. 
And they listed them. One of them was, uh, marijuana is not a gateway drug. Yes, it absolutely is. It is a gateway drug partly because of how it works. Thank you. Because of how it works on those receptors. You see, what happens after that is you become more sensitive to any drug you try after that. And you know how the studies bail that out? Anyone who smokes marijuana is like, I forget how many times more likely to become addicted to cigarettes. Because now that pathway I showed you before of the nicotine stimulating the dopamine is actually more sensitive and you're more likely to actually become addicted to nicotine. Marijuana is not a joke. And unfortunately, y'all young people are using it. And when we see them, by the time we see them, a lot of times they're on other drugs as well. But this is, this is one of the things you want to avoid because marijuana and alcohol both work on this chemical, GABA, which is gamma aminobutyric acid. It's mainly responsible for reducing the activity of neurons. It is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. GABA also helps make our bodies make endorphins, so you get more of a natural feeling of good. It affects mood by reducing high levels of adrenaline, noradrenaline, and dopamine. Having high amounts of GABA in the brain is linked to being relaxed and happy. Marijuana and alcohol actually block GABA. It makes you less inhibited. That's why when people get drunk, my, my Jamaican grandmother would say, a drunk man's tongue is a sober man's mind. Right? It, it blocks so that the, like your real self comes out. But what else does marijuana do? Marijuana is linked to heart disease. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Um, it even has, when you start smoking in, in midlife, cognitive effects in midlife um, from long-term cannabis use. So what they're finding now, that people have been smoking long and they can study it, it actually causes dementia or increases the risk of dementia. I talked to the young people about some of the things marijuana does. Marijuana doesn't just, you know, promote dementia. It creates a disease called amotivational syndrome. You ever heard of it? It is basically a disease that takes your ambition from you because it messes up those dopamine receptors. So normally you get an A on a test, you rejoice. But if your dopamine receptors don't work, it's like, yeah, who cares? So you don't have the ambition to study and to do well like you're supposed to. It creates um, diseases. Like there's a new disease, cannabis-induced hyperemesis syndrome. You ever heard of that? That's a disease where people can't stop throwing up. I saw three patients like that when I was in California. They just can't stop. Days later, they still they're just wretched. Can't stop throwing up. And it increases the risk of psychosis and schizophrenia. We talked about that in the, in the youth group. You don't want psych, uh, psycho, to have a psychotic break. And I saw this. I remember working at one of the community college and student health in California, and a kid had a psychotic break like that. It was this, one of the most scariest things I've ever seen. I told the young people the story of this kid when Colorado first legalized marijuana. They sold him a, um, a brownie. You know, the brownie was pretty big. The guy at the store at the dispensary told him, you're supposed to, be supposed to eat a fourth of it at a time, and you got to space it out every eight to 12 hours. What do you think he did? He ate the whole thing. You know why? Because when you do edibles, it takes longer for it to kick in, and it was taking him too long, so he ate the whole brownie in, in like an hour. When the whole thing kicked in, he went into a psych. this is a true story, he went into a psychotic episode, jumped from the window of the hotel to his death. But this stuff doesn't make the news, because they want you to believe this stuff is harmless. They want you to think there's nothing to it. Frequent marijuana use may be related to Risky decision-making in young adults. This is one of the biggest things. So, if the frontal lobe is where the Holy Spirit works, if the frontal lobe is where God connects with us, if this is where the uh, seal of the living God goes, do not think it's a coincidence that every third or fourth commercial on television is for alcohol. Don't think it's a coincidence that in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York now, Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania all over the place, these giant billboards for dispensaries. This is Satan literally advertising your demise. He wants people addicted because we just read, you are to be sober. So he's trying to get everyone caught on these things. The devil knows once you get on this thing, you're in trouble. I, I quoted to the young people a quote from Dr. James Kyle, one of my friends, a physician and a pastor out in the West Coast. He has a saying where he say, your body will conspire to kill you. If you give yourself everything you crave, everything you want, your body will conspire to kill you. And that's what happens in addiction, right? If people ultimately, I, I look at Whit, um, Whitney Houston, phenomenal, probably maybe the best singer of the modern era. Drugs. Elvis Presley, 
Drugs. Michael Jackson? Drugs. Prince? Drugs. Why? Because when you there's no bottom. When money, when there's no limit to the amount of money you have, ultimately the drugs, your, your body will conspire to kill you. The drugs will kill you. Most people stop because they reach a point where they can't, they just can't do it anymore. So this is the number of mass shootings in the United States between 1982 <coughs> and February 2023. I show these in prophecy slides when I'm talking about Matthew 24 and Luke 21 to show you that something really has changed, right? People, you know, you know not, I'm not that I'm a gun advocate, but it's not like there weren't guns 100 years ago. But somehow, something has changed where now people have decided to use them to mass to do mass shootings. What's changed? Well, one of the things, Dr. Neil Nedley, I was out at Weimar uh, earlier this year. Dr. Neil Nedley, very brilliant physician, he and I were talking off the record, and we're talking about this, and he said, one of the things they're not talking about is that alcohol helps make people suicidal and sometimes homicidal. Marijuana can even make you homicidal. The combination can do both. But there's something about this, these new strong strains of weed that make people annihilistic, makes them want to kill everyone. He says, what the media is not telling you is how many of these mass shootings are connected to marijuana. I said, that's something that I haven't heard. I haven't seen, um, I'd love to see it, but I don't think they'd let it out. So that is the most, those are the most, some of the strongest things, alcohol, marijuana. We talked in the youth group about pornography, how it shrinks the brain when you get addicted to pornography, uh, how it moves um, the mind back to a more juvenile state. These are all the things the devil is trying to get us addicted to. But one of the things that's really interesting is food itself. So the impact of diet on antisocial, violent, and criminal behavior. This is a study from the Neuroscience uh, Biobehavioral Review. There's one here from the U.S. Department of Justice, the Office of Justice Programs, Food for Thought, the role of nutrients in reducing aggression, violence, and criminal behavior. The government has figured out that there's something, there's a connection between what people eat and how violent and aggressive they are. But they have not told you that in the public. But I'm going to show you that this, this is documented. This article actually, uh, actually they've recognized it. The government is recognizing it. Is the food changing in the grocery store? No, because the, 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 the actual overall, the profitability of Nabisco and Heinz and all these other big companies is probably what's most important. McDonald's, Burger King, them making money. But the government knows something a lot of people don't know. And here's one study. This is a fascinating one. A vegan diet impacts recidivism. <clears throat> Most cynics would say prisoners don't deserve good food. Uh, they committed a crime, just keep giving them slop because we don't want our tax dollars going to feed those criminals. A Seventh-day Adventist group opened up a, criminal, uh, criminal, a prison in Victorville, California, called Maranatha, Maranatha Prison is what they were called. I want you to see this. So what they did, I'll read it from here. Terry Moreland, the CEO of Maranatha Private Corrections, LLC, was among those individuals who bid on the project for a new prison in California. There was only one catch. Moreland's bid included a stipulation that if he was awarded the bid, inmates serving sentences at his facility would be offered a vegan diet. So it's an Adventist trying to use our health message to help the inmates. As fate would have it, Moreland won the bid in 1997. That's the year I got to Loma Linda, so I got to actually know some of these folks began to build what became the Victor Valley Medium Community Correctional Facility in Adelanto, California, about 120 miles northeast of Los Angeles, closer to Loma Linda. Once operational, this facility saw remarkable results. Look at this. For seven years, before a dispute over inmate phone revenue led the state of California to cancel the contract with Moreland. They canceled it over a phone contract. Let me show you what the prison did. It is unbelievable that something as silly as phone revenue could cause a state to end one of the most remarkable prison success programs in the country where inmates got out and stayed out. At the time, the state, California, state of California had a recidivism rate. That means how many, if you let out 100 people, according to this, 95 of them were back in prison in California. A rate of 95%. This percentage of former prisoners who, who are rearrested. The Victor Valley facility enjoyed a recidivism rate of less than... 2%. So what was the key factor behind the success? A vegan diet. They had two pathways in the prison. You could do the standard California Department of Corrections food, which is heavy in meat and saturated fat and processed stuff, or you could do more whole food, plant. they call it vegan, but it was really a more whole food, plant-based diet. 
At the end of seven years, they saw this. In fact, on the yard, and I, I worked in, 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 in correctional medicine before in, in Orange County. On the yard, what you find is that black people stick together. And Latinos stick together, but sometimes it's like the Mexicans stick together, and then some of the other groups stick together, and then whites would stick together, right? It was very race-based, very ethnic-based, and even blacks would be split among bloods and the Crips. So, it was, you know, everybody had their little clique, but it was very race-based. In the Adventist prison, the side where they ate the whole food plant-based diet, everybody just worked together. They all played together, worked out together, played ball together. None of it existed. It was a transformation, not just of the prison or even of the recidivism rate. What they did tr literally impacted how they behaved. And the state of California shut it down. You know why? There's too much money in prisons. If somebody figured out how to keep 98% of people from coming back to prison, California has the higher incarceration rate than like Iran. It has the largest women's prison in the world. There's more money in prisons in California probably than Hollywood. So they didn't want that to go away. But there's another example, PS244Q, for those of you who know uh, from New York, Public School 244 in Queens adopted a full vegetarian policy, and as a result, BMIs have gone down and kids get sick less often. The school standardized test scores even ranked 11th in the state. The 10 other schools with higher test scores have no English language learners, and they all had gifted, pro gifted programs, neither of which applies to PS244Q. And that's phenomenal. They switched them to a vegetarian diet, and a school with English as a second language learners, no gifted program, shot up to being the number 11 school in the state on tests. Does it matter what you eat? The science is getting to be overwhelming that our health message will actually help you to have a clearer mind, better mental health, better mood, be less aggressive. In other words, it allows you to cooperate with God's spirit better. Here's what the spirit of prophecy, letters and manuscripts, letter 2A, 1896 says this, the sons and daughters of the Lord should grow in efficiency. Their taste, their appetites must be brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. Their passions must be under control in order that they have a clear mind for the spirit to operate upon. Like the body, the mind derives its strength from the food it receives. And this is what Ellen White understood that science is now beginning to understand. It is broadened and elevated by pure strengthening food, but it is narrowed and debased by feeding upon that which is of the earth, earthy. And she's speaking really to, to processed foods, in my opinion, and I think to, to meat. So the question is, can we, can what we eat affect our mood and our mental clarity? The study, again, gut feelings, how the food affects your mood. I don't have time to get into that except to show you what I was talking about this morning, that the gut microbiome, what you eat, affects it. So if you, don't, if you feed the bad bacteria, toxins come in, the brain becomes inflamed, your mood, your attitude, everything changes. You eat the right foods, the toxins are locked out, and the, the, the nutrients that come in actually decrease inflammation, clear the mind, you think better, you feel better. And it doesn't happen simply because of what you eat. It's because of how what you eat. Also, especially high-fiber foods, carbohydrates with good carbs, affect those bacteria. Very profound. This is what the scientist says. What we eat, especially foods that contain chemical additives and ultra-processed foods, affects our gut environment and increases our risk, and increases our risk of disease. Ultra-processed foods contain substances extracted from food, such as sugar and starch, added from food constituents, hydrogenated fats, or made in a laboratory. And these are what does it. So in meat, there's a fat called arachidonic acid. I won't get too heavy into this, except to tell you that it's only found in animal foods. And it is a precursor to inflammatory chemicals in our bodies. By eating foods high in arachidonic acid, such as chicken, eggs, and other animal products, we set off a cascade of chemical reactions in our body. These reactions lead to an increase in inflammatory mediators circulating in the bloodstream. The result is general inflammation and an overreactive immune response. And when that gets to your brain, you can't think straight. There are people who are challenged to just go vegetarian, well, really whole food plant-based, for seven days. And at the end of seven days, they'll tell you, wow, I think so much clearer. There's a scientific reason for that, right? The other reason that the brain gets inflamed is iron. Did you know that the iron in meat is different from the iron in spinach. The iron in meat just floods your system, just comes in as much as it wants. In spinach, your body can keep out what it wants to keep out. So the science is what it says. Is iron in steak to blame for risks of Alzheimer's? 
Studies suggest excess red meat bad for the brain because oxygen rusts, doesn't it? It oxidizes. When it gets to your brain, it still oxidizes. That's what the science is beginning to show us, right? So the, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is talking about food and mood, eating plants to fight the blues. Why? Because serotonin, this is the chemical. Remember I talked about Prozac this morning and these drugs that are so popular? These are serotonin-selective reuptake inhibitors. What we found is that Americans eat a diet that reduces their serotonin, which is why they like these drugs. But if you change your diet, naturally the amino acid tryptophan will turn into serotonin in your brain. If you get it from meat, all the other amino acids compete and you don't get the serotonin. When you get it from plants, there's no competition and you get more of the serotonin. And so it comes in and it actually makes the serotonin, makes you feel better. The other reason this is important because serotonin ultimately becomes a chemical in your brain called melatonin. Have you heard of melatonin? So it goes from tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin. What does melatonin do? Helps you sleep. Here's something that most people don't know. Melatonin is also the most potent antioxidant or one of the most potent antioxidants known to man. A lot of people thought you could only get antioxidants when you eat blueberries and grapes. God actually has a system that if you live in a part of the world where you can't get all of those things, your body actually makes a potent antioxidant. But you have to eat the kind of foods that help make it, which is a whole food, plant-based diet. Pretty profound because that sleep is one of the ways that you feel better, as we'll show you. Melatonin is a potent and inducible um, endogenous antioxidant. The studies are starting to come out. I won't get into sugar. We know that sugar, you get these huge surges of sugar. You get a huge surge of insulin. So when it goes up and down, you get hunger, anxiety, panic. When you get the drop in sugar, you know, so if you're eating like a honey bun on the way to school as a child, by second, third period, all that sugar is gone out of your system. You can't pay attention in class, and you're not going to do good. Had you eaten a whole grain, you know, piece of toast and had some hummus on it, um, by the time you got to school, your brain, you know, all the way through to lunch, your, the body will be slowly releasing sugar like in this picture, right? So this is a sugary dice. You notice how much flatter the graph is. That's good for your mood, good for your brain. Right? Now, those of you from the islands, I'm going to show you this picture. That's why this food is so good. Right? I, you know, I go to Jamaica, I'm like, man, everybody's so happy. Then I remember, they eat so much better. Right? They're eating, whole, they're eating whole, a lot of whole foods. They're eating a lot of root foods. This is really good because in America, what we're eating is manufactured addiction. Right? The New York Times actually had an article that the overconsumption of fast food triggers addiction like Neural addictive responses. And I don't have time to go into this too deep, but this book, Michael Moss, I've been on a couple panels with him. Salt plus fat over a satisfying crunch times a pleasing mouthfeel is a food designed to addict. And we are watching this happen. This is the sugar consumption in the United States over the last couple hundred, uh, over the last hundred years, couple hundred years. Massive increase in sugar consumption in the United States. What does sugar do to the brain? Well, here's a normal brain. You see the red areas? That's high in dopamine, so you can feel pleasure, you can, be, you can feel normal. Cocaine, gone. You know what is like cocaine? Sugar. It does the same thing to your brain's ability to, uh, to have normal uh, pleasure responses. Why is that important? Because I believe that, the, I was telling the young people, that by, the standard American diet sets the brain up for alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, later in life. It primes the brain for you to become addicted later on and to, and, and to mess with your ability to get the, the seal of the living God. I won't get into cheese too much, except this is Neil Bernard, the head of the Physician for um, Responsible Medicine, has a book called The Cheese Trap. They call it cheese. Cheese is so addictive, they call it dairy crack. There are casomorphones in cheese, which are related to heroin and morphine. And it actually is a very low amount, but it is actually addicting. And a lot of people will tell you they gave up meat no problem, but cheese, the cheese was chasing them around the kitchen. They couldn't give up the cheese. So a high-fat refined sugar diet reduces hippocampal brain-derived neurotropic factor, neuronal plasticity, and learning. When you eat the standard American diet, high in fat, high in sugar, it messes up your child's ability to learn, but also the plasticity of the brain, its ability to adapt and develop. Remember, you, we talk to young people about this. Your brain doesn't stop developing until you're 25 years old. So these foods actually do that. So what does God say to do? Well, first of all, he tells you to eat lentils. Did you know God told you to eat lentils? In the book of Daniel chapter 1, called Pulse. Some of you guys live near Pulse, the restaurant up there in Massachusetts. 
well, I'm in Massachusetts, further up into Massachusetts, right? Pulse, when you look at the translation, actually is lentils. It is one of the healthiest things you can do. It improves cognitive function, good source of vitamin Bs. Actually, there's studies that show it can actually prevent, reverse, or slow down dementia. Very, very potent food. I, won't, I can't get into a good, good source of protein, fiber, everything. What else? You need to eat foods rich in nitric oxides. I'm going to say this. The, many of you will know what I mean, and I won't even say it. There are a lot of men who need a blue pill. That's all I'm going to say. But what we have found is that watermelon, especially actually the yellow watermelon, um, um, these are beets and garlic. They, have, they cause an increase in nitric oxide, which naturally dilates blood vessels. In the brain, so you get more flow to your brain, less likely you get a stroke. But it works on all of your blood vessels. And the men that eat this stuff should say amen. Now, what else does this? Blueberries. Blueberries actually enhance brain blood flow. Blueberry supplementation improves memory in older adults. If your kid eats blueberries before going to school, the studies show your child will actually perform better in school. Now, if you haven't had a chance and have not seen the Netflix special on um, the, um, the Blue Zones yet, the one on um, when they're in uh, um, Okinawa, Japan is really interesting. They have a purple yam that has, a, I think, 150 times the antioxidants of a blueberry. And I found that they serve, they sell them at the Indian stores, um, East Indian stores here in the States. So I got to go look for them. But blueberries are very good. If you give your kids a, a cup of blueberries, they do better on test scores than the kids who get no blueberries. Your child should almost never leave home without some berries in the morning before they're going to school. Literally, that's what the studies show. Nuts and seeds, I won't get into this too much, but the same thing. There's good healthy fats in like walnuts are good for the brain development. Uh, herbs like turmeric, and, uh, which has curcumin, it gives it its color. It's anti-inflammatory. They actually have studies in India that show it improves memory in Alzheimer's patients and can remove the plaques that cause the disease. Eating curry is good for the brain. A Jamaican should say amen on that one, right? Tofu and soy. A lot of people say, oh, soy is bad. But not, not true. It contains antioxidants called polyphenols, helps support parts of the brain involved in memory creation. So tofu is another way. It's, it's a less processed soy product. Very, very good for you. And, of course, I won't get into it, but whole grains are real important. We were at a church recently, and they had brown rice and white rice, and we had some brown rice, and the lady said, you know, brown rice isn't good for you. White rice is better. I said, I said ma'am, the opposite is actually true. I thought she was going to throw the pot of rice on us, so I had to stop arguing with her. But that's not true. It's the more whole the food, the better it is for you. Now, let's move from food to what else you can do to improve the brain function. Harvard Health Publishing has this article, Regular Exercise Changes the Brain to Improve Memory and Thinking Skills. What we have found is that there are very few things that can actually help your brain to grow back. I mentioned it briefly this morning. They have found that exercise does that. Half an hour, 45 minutes of walking a day. If you, and this is what I, I tell my patients who have come out of drug addiction. Exercising every day is one of the ways. The Bible says in the book of Joel, God says, I will restore unto you the land that the locusts have, have taken. Joel says that. Here's why that's so important. What did I say? Oh, Joel, Joel, yeah, Joel. I, I don't, I, yeah, Joel is the book. Here's why that's important. It means that even after damage has been done to the brain, God has a mechanism to restore it. There's a reason the children of Israel walked for 40 years. There was a lot of healing, and even that generation couldn't properly even get it all together. All through the Bible, you'll notice there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a pattern. Remember Elijah this morning? After everything, he, had to, he walked for 40 days. He didn't just fast for 40 days. He walked for 40 days. What else? Well, one of the things I, want, I talked about this morning is the power of sleep in healing and healing trauma with our dreams, the National Institute for Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine. We now know that sleep is critical. Research at, researchers at UC Berkeley have found that when dreams occur during the REM, rapid eye movement stage of sleep, our stress response is shut down. This is really important, church. And the neurochemicals responsible for stressful feelings stop being released. Not only this, but REM helps reduce the negative effects of difficult memories because it is norepinephrine that is released to trigger PTSD. When you get quality sleep in the REM stage, you turn it off. And then you allow yourself in the dream state, this is what the recent research is saying, to actually process what's happened to you. 
And what the devil has done with electric lights and the blue lights from our TV screens and our computer screens, caffeinated beverages, alcohol, late night eating, mess up the quality of sleep so you can't heal from your trauma. The dream stage of sleep, based on its unique neurochemical composition, provides with a form of overnight therapy. This is what the science says now. A soothing balm that removes the sharp edges from the prior day's emotional experiences. And you can see that was published in Current Biology. Um, exercise regrows the brain. That was actually supposed to be a couple slides back. It actually regrows the brain. This is incredible science that is just coming out. But I want to end with this. One of the most important things you can do for your mental health and to recover if you've had traumatic episodes and things like that. Here's what they say. Religious faith can lead to positive mental benefits, writes a Stanford anthropologist. And I don't think the Stanford anthropologist is a Christian. The science is telling us this. Look at this. Science says religion is good for your health. This is Forbes. Again, this is, this is not the Review and Herald. This is, this is Forbes. Here it is. There is an ample reason to believe that faith in a higher power is associated with health and in a positive way. For example, researchers at the Mayo Clinic included, most studies have shown that religious involvement and spirituality are associated with better health outcomes, including greater longevity, coping skills, and health-related quality of life, even during terminal illness and less anxiety, depression, and suicide. Several studies have shown that addressing the spiritual needs of the patient may enhance recovery from illness. Do you, I mean, can you, you, you guys may not get, we were, we were told in medical school, leave this out. It wasn't until I got to Loma Linda that we, you could pray with patients and stuff. I want you to get that the world is beginning to realize that new start, that last T, trust in God. It actually works. The health benefits of the Christian faith. Um, this is, this is the, the, um, um, from England. Religion is for the hesitant. This is what the, the, psych, the psychiatric journal uh, um, textbook used to say. This, I'm re, this is from the psych, psychiatric textbook. Religion is for the hesitant, the guilt-ridden, the, excess, the excessively timid, those lacking clear convictions with which to face life. So they used to beat us up. Set a standard British textbook of psychiatry until 1969. The implication is clear. Faith selects the weak and is probably bad for your health. Sigmund Freud went so far as to call it a neurosis. Sigmund Freud is not one of my favorite people. Right. But here's what the science now says. Is there a link between faith and health? Evidence from over 1,200 studies. How many studies? That's a lot of studies. And 400 reviews has shown an association between faith and a number of positive health benefits, including protection from illness, coping with illness, and faster recovery from it. So of the studies reviewed in the uh, definitive analysis, 81% showed benefit and only 4% showed harm. That's why you want lots of studies. The raw data from some large studies show a significant benefit in mortality for those involved in organized religion. For instance, one study followed 21,000 plus people, uh, represented, representative of American adults over nine years, and correlated death rates with religious activity and a large range of other data. Income and education had, had, look at this church, had surprisingly little impact. But those who attended church regularly had a life expectancy seven years longer than those who did not. I'm going to show you that it gets deeper. For black people, the benefit was 14 years. The researchers attributed the benefit to more protective relationships, look at this, including marriage and to healthier behaviors. On that Netflix documentary, he discounts that uniquely seven-day Adventism is the reason Loma Linda has a blue zone. He says you can believe in anything. But if that's the case, why doesn't every other religion have the same results? There is something unique about what we believe and teach. And God allowed this Blue Zone study to happen so that a secular person could confirm the power of the three angels' messages, the health message, the loud cry, the Sabbath, and the day of rest. All these things that the world mocks us about. Here is Netflix and a guy who has nothing to do with anything saying, actually, there is something special about this group. Um... I'll skip these. That was a lot. Um, benefit for mental health. This is the conclusion of the large literature review and is endorsed by, um, um, well, I got to go back in. In the majority of studies, religious involvement is correlated with well-being, happiness, and life satisfaction, hope and optimism, purpose and meaning in life, higher self-esteem, better adaptation to bereavement, greater social support and less loneliness, lower rates of depression and faster recovery from depression, lower rates of suicide, and fewer positive attitudes towards suicide, less anxiety, less psychosis, and fewer psychotic tendencies, lower rates of alcohol and drug abuse, less delinquency and criminal activity, 
greater mental stability and satisfaction. This is the conclusion of the largest literature review and is endorsed by a former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in England. He laments the lack, look at this, look at what he says. He laments the lack of attention given to the strong evidence for anything other than religion and spirituality, governments and health providers would be doing their utmost to promote it. He says if there was a, if there was a pill that did what going to church does, everybody in the world would be promoting it. And yet our churches often sit empty. You want good mental health? The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Last slide is this one. Matthew 24 and verse 13 says this. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The seal of the living God is going to be given. We have been given all these tools, all the pieces of the Adventist health message, all the, the, the Sabbath itself. I didn't get into the, how the benefits of the Sabbath. There's a whole bunch of studies on that. All of this has been given to us. And we have to make up our minds. We will we'll not ridicule it, not mock it. I see people mock what we teach. What we teach, the science supports it. Some folk don't want to believe the Bible. Then you can believe the science if you want. But I, I don't need the science. The Bible is enough. And I challenge you, as we leave this mental health symposium, remember that what God has given this denomination is good for your body, it's good for your mind, it's good for eternity. Amen.